You're listening to the Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Enjoy. Dr. Julie Beischel joins us this portion of our program. Julie is Director of Research at the Winbridge Institute, and she has spent over a decade studying psychic mediums, who in particular experience communication with the dead. Her Kindle book, Among Mediums, presents research investigating the accuracy and specificity of information reported by mediums, unique aspects of mediums' experiences, psychology and physiology, and potentially the useful social applications of mediumship, readings in fields including bereavement, and of life care, and forensics. I thought her work was fascinating, and while I think this is the first spindle ebook I've ever done on radio, I'm glad it's a first in something that means so much to me, which is the continuation of consciousness from life to death and life again. Thank you for joining us, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a fascinating study that you've done, and I know your Ph.D. background's a little different than this. So why don't you share with our audience how you got involved in this most unusual work? Okay. Uh, My bachelor's degree is in environmental sciences, and then my Ph.D. is in pharmacology and toxicology with a minor in microbiology and immunology. So no, not a direct correlation (laughs) at all. And um, I talk extensively about, I tell this story pretty extensively um, in my book, Among Mediums, but the short version is when I was in graduate school, my mom committed suicide. And a few years later, after I'd gone through sort of my natural process of grief, um, the television show Crossing Over with John Edward was uh, really big. And that was really the first time I'd ever heard of what a medium was. And... um, The people on the show looked very moved by what he was saying, and it was very specific information. And so as a scientist, I wanted to check it out for myself. So um, I had a reading with a local medium, and it was very evidential. And I thought, well, wow, there's there's something to this. Something is going on here. And I brought my experience back. You know, I said I was in graduate school, and I told the other students and some of my professors um, about this experience. And as good scientists most of them said oh I don't really know anything about that but that sounds like a very interesting experience and they just went on with their day but a couple people um, said no those people are all frauds and you were taken and you you know you it was they used cold reading and and I was like no I was there Uh, I I was there that's not how it happened and so I really I have a very strong sense of justice and I thought that was terribly unfair that there were these group of people who have these spontaneous experiences and are good at it and use it to help people. And there were these other people who were disparaging them and dismissing them as all con artists based on assumptions and no data. And so I thought they, you know, a scientist needs to look at this specifically and to, you know, really get to the bottom of this. And I looked into it and there hadn't been a lot of research, you know, um, scientists have been, looking into mediumship um, since the 1880s, but not a lot had been done uh, relatively recently. So I thought, well, here is my path laid right out for me, and this is what I'll be doing with my life, I guess. It's fascinating. I mean, it's a fascinating turn from sort of being a clinical scientist of all the way down to the little molecules of things that happen in biology to being exposed to using our faculty of consciousness that's outside time and space and then deciding to document how, in fact, this happens. I I think it's wonderful. I mean, your personal story is dramatic, and the fact that you've now created the Winbridge Institute, and that's how I found you, was a link of something I was looking at, and then it linked to Winbridge Institute, and that's how I found you. So now you, you write that in terms of mediumship, particularly in speaking with those who are no longer incarnate, I don't like to call them the dead. I just never have felt comfortable with calling people dead because they're not dead. They just don't have bodies. Right. So right. I'd like they're, to say mediumship the, the, with people without their bodies on. <laughs> yeah. Or the, I say the physically challenged, right? They, they don't have a body. Yeah. No, we, the clinical, the scientific term we use is discarnate, which means not in the flesh. Okay. The discarnate. So, yeah. I like discarnate, that. You, yeah. You're right that there are several theories of what is taking place. And I wanted to start there with these three different theories about what's happening. Okay. So uh, we have collected evidence that demonstrates that certain mediums can, in fact, provide 
accurate and specific information about discarnates when all normal explanations for where they might be getting their information are controlled for. So we've eliminated fraud and we've eliminated information so general it could apply to anyone. And we've eliminated sensory feedback and cueing and all those sorts of things. And when you eliminate all those things, they still are providing this accurate and specific information. So the next question is, where is that information coming from? Because we can't just conclude, yes, they're talking to, pardon my use of the term, the dead. Uh, so there are three um, major theories. So um, basically, you can just think of it as two. We'll just talk about it um, sort of higher levels, two different things. So one, mediums are using their psychic ability to communicate with the deceased and or two they're using their psychic ability to get the information about the deceased from the living or from the future or clairvoyantly from your grandmother's attic or something like that mm -hmm. so um the it's very hard to differentiate between the two because they're both using sight right they're they're not hearing the deceased talk um, right, so it's kind ear. of like a, a psychic reservoir, as you, I think you stated in your book. It's, right, that's one of the theories, mm -hmm. right, is the psychic reservoir. So they're getting their information potentially from, like, the Akashic field, or like, all the information is stored somewhere, and they're just accessing that store of information. Which, which I want to add, and any medium will tell everybody else, anybody can learn to do, and some mediums are just naturally gifted and it's already developed, but many practice for years in order to develop this muscle, if you will, of hearing outside the bounds of physical ears or seeing outside the physical eyes. So one right. is in the psychic reservoir. Right. And, and you know, that's uh, included with that. So there's, um, is, it's sort of all grouped. The theory is some kinds, sometimes called super psi. Mm -hmm. So it's the use of psi, PSI, um, psi abilities to get information from that um, psychic reservoir from the living, right? Mm -hmm. From the sitter, the living person wanting to hear from the discarnate. So they have information about the discarnate. So is the medium just reading it from them mm -hmm. or are they reading it into the future or clairvoyantly from distant places? So they're using some form of psi with the living mm -hmm. um, or they're using some form of psi uh, where they're communicating with the deceased with the continued souls of the or spirits or however you want to think of it with the deceased right because they're not seeing them with their eyes they're not hearing them with their ears it's happening um, mentally um, using some sort of psi ability and and so it's for a hundred years there's been this debate and so it's difficult to talk about right because for a while it was called the super psi versus survival debate but then well, even if they are talking to the dead, then that also is using psi. So then it was like the, mm -hmm. the super psi versus psi. So then we coined this term survival psi to, to um, explain how they're using psi to talk to the deceased. So that's the two things are sort of. Um, right. And, and so when you started looking at this, I know that you asked the mediums themselves a very particular set of questions, meaning you had a standard set of questions, a protocol, if you will, with the mediums in order to kind of start discerning how each does what they do. So talk to us about your protocol. Um, let me back up one second because I just misspoke. So okay. the, I just want to clear that up. Please. Um, so I said we coined the term survival psi. That's not true. We coined this term somatic psi, which is the, that they're using, that they're talking that they're getting their information from the living um, versus survival side, which means they're getting their information from the dead. So okay. the, the two theories are survival side and somatic side. So we'll move on from there. All right. So the protocol that we use um, is not to test. I think what you're talking about is our quintuple blind protocol. Right. And that is a protocol that's used to eliminate all the normal explanations for where they're getting their information, but it doesn't help us determine the source of the information. Mm -hmm. So we have to go in a different direction. So we've done a number of studies where we, where we try to get to the bottom of this source of information question by studying the medium's what's called phenomenology, so right. their experience of the acquisition of the two types of information. Because if you just ask them, they know what somatic psi what psychic information from the living feels like and right. this 
what they experience as communication with the dead feels different to them. I, I would so, agree with that, given that I've done that kind of work since I was a child. I didn't train. It's just when I get in the bathtub, there they are. They all mm-hmm. start talking like it's Grand Central. So <laughs> one, one of the things that you studied was this anomalous information reception that mediums have. And this is sort of something, I guess, a way that you've added to this discussion of where is this information coming from and how do they get it? Well, that term anomalous information reception is just the term that we use to describe that they're getting uh, specific and accurate information about the disease. It's called anomalous because we don't know where it's coming Uh from. So uh so the the data that that demonstrate anomalous information reception cannot differentiate between the source of the information. So we just say anomalous. It's coming from somewhere and we don't know where it's coming from. Right. So it's a different sort of research program that investigates the source of the information. And that's this phenomenology research where we... um, are investigating their experiences. So we've published one paper, um, which was qualitative, where we just had them describe, describe in as much detail, we just emailed them questions, describe in as much detail your experiences when communicating with the deceased and describe your experiences when accessing psychic information about the living. And it was a week apart. The questions were in, they were all counterbalanced and it was all controlled. And so we published that paper and there were, of course, some similarities because it's still the acquisition of non-local information, but there were some differences. And so recently we did a study um, and I, I just uh, in June, I just presented the results um, publicly for the first time. And I'm so excited about the study because it really gets to the bottom of that question because what we did was we gave the mediums read our uh, mediums that we work with at the Winbridge Institute. Um, some of the readings they did were for living people and some were for deceased people and they didn't know which were which. Oh, and then after each reading, they filled out this standardized questionnaire that we didn't develop. It's a, it's a standard psycho- psychological instrument about, and it quantitates different 26 different levels of, or of, uh, um, pardon me, dimensions of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it puts a number on like, how much were you feeling joy? How much were you feeling sadness? How Mm -hmm. much were you feeling, you know, and, and so, um, well, and that's really interesting. I'm sorry. Under these blinded conditions, we found there was a statistically significant difference between the way they experienced information about the deceased versus about the living under blinded conditions. They didn't know which Mm-hmm. readings were which mm-hmm. so the way the medium felt during the reception was different if the person was living versus the person was deceased that's correct mm-hmm. and, and that's that that's novel that's a first time um that anyone has found that has looked at that and and um, gathered that data under those blinded conditions that's fascinating because yeah. you you also said that you know you found that after working with different mediums and what kind of mediums did you study were, were there male and female um, there, we have a team of um, Winbridge certified research mediums that we work with, and um, it's about ninety percent female, which is what we found. Yeah, it's when general we sort in of the put public. Out the cattle call, yeah. like we're looking for mediums. It was about ninety percent female. Yeah. And uh, I should say, first of all, that recruitment is closed. We have about twenty, and and that's a comfortable number for our research. So we have this team, and we're we're not. Um, certifying any new mediums, um, but they go through an eight-step process, and they're screened and trained and tested and interviewed, and um, the mediums that pass become Winbridge certified research mediums, and then they're part of the research team. So whenever we do a study, we have this um, a group. Same pool. way remote viewing yeah, was done be- by Stanford. They had a number of trained people who had studied the protocols of remote viewing, and somebody was a handler yeah. and somebody else was a viewer. And that makes a lot of sense to be working with a stable of professionals so that you can, um, you know, really start to examine what actually is going on for the medium. You know, most of the time people look at what's happening to the person getting the reading or what's happening about the reading. You know, where what's the yeah, content? Well, no one's looking at either one of those things like those. Both of those things are really important. But this is a really this this topic has not been studied to the extent to which it should. No, I agree with you. I've always felt myself that the phenomenology of this consciousness capacity was really what was missing. I mean, people looked at it, but not in the way you are. Look, we're going to take a little break, Dr. Bichelle. And when we come back, I want to talk about some of the things you found in common with the various mediums. I mean, you talk about psychology, physiology, and you just do a beautiful job. You can follow up after the show or during our break at www.windabridge.org. We'll be right back. 
Hi, this is Jorge Aguilar. I'm the Southern Region Director for Food and Water Watch. You can find us at www.foodandwaterwatch.org. And you are listening to Dr. Sohar Hieronymus on 21st Century Radio. Among Mediums, a scientist's quest for answers. It's by the Winbridge Institute, and you can go to winbridge.org. So coming back then, Julie, to your desire um, to study, and I was glad to see you're on the adjunct faculty at Saybrook University because Dr. Stanley Krippner has worked so hard for so long with mediums in South America. Mm-hmm. So when you've been working with these mediums, what are some of the common things that you've noticed about the mediums themselves? Um Yeah, the first distinction is the mediums that Dr. Krivner studies are spiritist mediums, Uh um, mostly in Brazil. And our mediums are all American mediums, and um, they are sort of non-secular. It's it's not associated with a belief system. It's just a perception that they have and they they use. So that's um, Mm -hmm. one big difference there. And um, one of the things that we've looked at um, is the, the medium psychology their personality type so it during the um screening we give them a a barrage of psychology tests and we don't use that we don't use them to that doesn't it's not to screen people out like oh you did not pass our psychology test but we just want to collect that information from as many mediums as possible Mm -hmm. so one of the tests that we give them is the myers-briggs type indicator which i think a lot of people are familiar with and it uh it it gives you 16 types there. It's based on Carl Jung's theories of personality and it puts people in um, 16. They're one of 16 personality types and none are worse than or better than any other one. So there it's based on um, dichotomies and you, and you get these four letters. So, so it's like extroversion, introversion, thinking, feeling. So you can, you're like, you get this four letter acronym and that's your personality. And so um, one of the, it's, um, intuition and sensing are is one and thinking and feeling are one and so people who are both n and f so intuitive and feeling um in the general population it's about 16 percent of of people in the country are n and f and we found that um mediums 85 percent are Mm -hmm. and that's um that's common that's what other researchers have found with people who are are good at um, psychic tests and so um, it was what I really found interesting was if you look um, in the data that the Myers-Briggs test people publish, uh, they, it shows which professions have the different personality types. And so the profession that has the highest percentage of people who are N and F are clergy at 55 percent and then followed closely by art, music and drama teachers at 54 percent. And the profession with the lowest percent of people who are both N and F are police and detectives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really interesting. And that's probably why they mediums and psychics and the police don't work together more than they do because they just can't conceive of how the other one thinks. Right. And yet that's one of the things that you're talking about is, is how important mediums can be in terms of solving crimes. Potentially, yeah. Um, you know, when you want to gather as much information as you can when you're trying to solve a crime or find missing person or missing animal, and this may be a good um, a good way to get some new information. Uh, so uh, I think a lot of research needs to be done, however, because resources resources are limited, right? The police can't chase every lead they have, right? So they need to be able to determine which ones are worthy of being chased and there a lot of research needs to be done to determine like well when they say a name then maybe that's not one that's that's accurate all the time but when they talk about you know uh, the the environment Mm -hmm. maybe that's something we can trust and that's something that you want to go or you know so we don't know we don't know what types of things um are are good are reliable Well, and it's interesting because you note that, you know, one of the things is how long does the crime scene itself impart information to a medium? Like it's a lot different to get somebody there 
on the first day or just to call them even if they're half, you know, the planet away. It doesn't really matter. A good medium can read from anywhere in the world, but some read because they have a telekinetic connection. They need to either see it or they need to touch something of the person that's in question. But have you done any study about these kinds of things, about like that question of how long does a crime scene impart information? No, we actually, it's a, it's a research topic that I'm really interested in, but we haven't um, yet been able to, to investigate those Mm -hmm. questions because, you know, we're a small, we're independent research organization and we have limited staff and there's only so many studies that we can do. So that's something I'm really interested in, but it's not something that we have looked into just yet. Right. But one of the things that Winbridge Institute talks about, and as you experienced for your own life and how this became a passion and a career of yours because of your mother's passing is that how much this kind of medium mystic work helps people who are grieving. Yeah, I, that is my main passion right now. That's my main focus of of this research. And, you know, our full name is the Winbridge Institute for Applied Research in Human Potential. So we're really just interested at the end of the day of the applications of mm-hmm. these phenomena. Mm-hmm. What can, how can they help people? So, um, yeah, that is really my main focus is, is uh, mediumship readings as a potential treatment in for the bereaved. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to some people, you know, the anecdotal data is that um, it's almost night and day for some people. They are grieving for years and years and years even, and they have a reading and it's like everything changes. And if you talk to traditional you know, the traditional grief literature, traditional grief counselors, they'll tell you that's the focus of grief work is redefining the relationship. The person isn't gone. They're just not in the room anymore with you. They're, they just don't have a, you know, you have to have to redefine the relationship. So a mediumship reading is wonderful at that because it provides evidence that the person is still in your life. And that's all some people need. And, but like any treatment option, people are are out in the world doing it, but we don't really know anything about it. We don't know as as scientists um, who it's good for, when it's good, and all those kinds of things. So we need to gather that information. And I have a, a research paper coming out in the journal Omega, the Journal of Death and Dying, and it discusses this, the potential and the, you know, what we still need to know. And we have um, recently begun crowdfunding for a study um, at the Wimber Institute, it was called the BAM study, Bereavement and Mediumship, or BAM. And I thought that was a good acronym because that's how it can feel when someone dies, right? Mm-hmm. BAM, your mm-hmm. life is never the mm-hmm. same. So well, it's I so that interesting because, good... you know, Dr. Raymond Moody's work with communicating with the deceased, he started to notice that the, you know, the Greeks had these psychomantiums, so he's obviously mm-hmm. created one. And, mm-hmm. you know, you look at cultures around the world, except for Western industrial ones, and speaking with the deceased is very much a part of culture yeah, and honoring the deceased. It's just that for some reason, in this dense materialistic age, somehow or other, there's only what you can touch, see, smell, taste exists, and yet we all know that's not true. Right, and, you know, we have to work within the the rules right of our culture and our society and our and science and so i've designed a clinical trial my phd is in pharmacology so my training is in designing drug trials Mm -hmm. and so i designed a drug trial except it's not a drug it's a mediumship reading and so it uses a standardized um instrument for assessing grief and um and that's the first step we need to do that step to, you know, to even say, is there or is there not an effect? We don't know. It's no one's ever looked at that before. And if there is, then that there's a whole bunch of questions that come after that. Like I said, who is it good for? When is it good? You know, what sorts of things, what kind of training can we provide to sitters before they get a reading so that they're well prepared? And I, I personally think that the best treatment is going to be mediumship reading plus counselor. Because the medium has one job, and that is to provide to provide the information that she's experiencing. But how you integrate that into your life once you walk away, that's a different story. And that may require a different professional. And so I think it's probably the combination of the two that, that we're going to be able to show at some point in the future after this first study gets done. But like I said, then 
a bunch of other questions mm-hmm. need to be addressed. But well, when I you, think this is really an important, really important topic. It's a wonderful addition, I mean, to the whole literature and parapsychology, et cetera, altered states of consciousness. And, and one of the things I'm curious about from your own vantage point is you started out a different kind of scientist than what you're looking at now. And how has this work affected you and, and the way you see the world or the way people see you? Um, well, you know, science is just a tool, right? It's just one way of knowing. Mm -hmm. And so you can use science to, to look at anything. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't really change, you know, that hasn't changed. Like this didn't open up science for me or anything like, oh, wow, science can do this. Like I knew science could do anything. Science can look at anything. But, um, you know, I, I try, I'm a scientist, so my training is remaining objective Mm -hmm. while, you know, I I will say that unlike some other scientists who study these sorts of things, I don't design my studies based on my assumptions of how I think it should work or Mm -hmm. how I think it does work Mm -hmm. that I, like I said, these mediums are on our team. So we get a lot of feedback from them about what's possible. And if we did a protocol like this, is that something that you could do? And they would say, no, that's not really what we say we can do. And, you know, we don't have experience with that. And so we change it and we, you know, and the only way you're going to learn anything about mediumship is you study it as it exists and as close to as it exists normally in reality as it can and to to hold it into these you know crazy standards that you know skeptical researchers right you need to be them, like, accurate 100 percent if not that 200 percent you know yeah right <laughs> unlike or anything fraud, else material like, no, no it's very interesting you're absolutely right dr byshaw is that they create standards for the parapsychology that they don't even create for the mundane realities it's so interesting so <laughs> when you look at all these various readings that your mediums have done um, for the living or of the living or of the deceased do you find that there's a common kind of happenstance between what the person the deceased is saying to the living because in my experience most of the time it's to share love compassion appreciation forgiveness I've rarely ever heard anybody from the other side give me a message to somebody else that was in some way you know inflammatory or destructive or unkind well I think in my experience there seems to be three types of information that the mediums report and Um, It's information identifying of the discarnate. So, Mm -hmm. you know, brown hair and this was my job and this was my personality. It's so that you can know who it is. Right. Yeah. That this is Uncle John. um, Right. 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 And then two information about the sitter's life since the person died. So Mm -hmm. evidence that they're still around. Mm hmm. And then three are messages like I love you and, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But I have I've never heard anything disparaging, but I have heard messages where um, I think that was the very first thing I learned in doing this research was when we die, we do not become immediately self-actualized. You're still you. <laughs> Too you bad. You just don't have a body. <laughs> so if you if you know, like I we had one reading and the, the message to the sitter was like, why is it my headstone? installed yet like the, she was sort of complaining so uh-huh. her, you know people still have their own um content <laughs> yeah they have uh-huh. their own beliefs and their own opinions and you know we there's a story that I've told before and um I did a reading with one a research reading with one of the mediums and afterward she said can you call me back off the record and I need to tell you something else and so I said sure and we did our reading and then I called her back and I said what's going on and she said your mom showed up today and she just keeps showing me your name, like Dr. Julie Beischel. Like, it's just one thing and you can't change. And she goes, you aren't thinking about changing your name or anything, were you? And I said, well, you don't know this, but actually uh, my husband and I were talking about getting married at the time. And we were trying to fi- I had published already. So we're trying to figure out, you know, do I want to change my name? Do we want to change it to some third name that's right. neither of ours and all this stuff? And the medium didn't know that. Right. And, you know, she's saying, well, your mom doesn't think that you should do that. And that's all well and good. And I didn't change my name, but not because my mom told me to, right? She's still just my mom. She, it's still just her opinion. And so I, I, we, I would caution people that the dead are not all knowing and they don't have all the information and you should take what they say with a grain of salt because they're still just people. 
Mm -hmm. That's true. But I, but I also find that there's a gentleness, at least I'm only speaking from my experience of readings that were done voluntarily or involuntarily, is there seems to be sort of a, a, a kindness about even the mistakes they made or that the living have made, but they don't necessarily, you know, make it seem like it's not anything. It's just that it's not primary. It's just an event. I, f I find that it gets reduced to these are just events. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't um, I didn't call this out, but in that study that we did where the mediums read some living targets and some deceased targets, and then they took the test and there were differences. The main difference between read experiences after readings for the deceased were that there was way more love. Yeah. The, the dimension of love yeah. was, was significantly higher in readings that the medium did um, for deceased people than for living people. And, mm -hmm. I, and I've interviewed them um, about the differences and that that's something that comes up is that they feel uh, when they do a reading for a deceased person, they feel connected to the universe and to everyone and they, and it's a loving feeling and they, you know, they're empowered by it and they're mm -hmm. energized by it. And when they do a reading um, for the living, it's, you know, one said, I feel alone. Like mm -hmm. she doesn't feel connected when she does a reading for mm -hmm. the living. Cause it's just gathering information. It's not a communication. It's not a, um, a collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because when you do readings for animals, there's none of the psychological traps that go on in readings for humans. They just tell you exactly what it is. It's very straightforward. And right. w when you have look at all the sort of scale, we have to take a break. But when we come back, I want to talk about the things that interest you the most because, you know, there are a thousand different research studies you could create. Oh, yeah, there are. <laughs> exactly. And so honing in on what will be the most productive in the sense of, you know, generalizing or normalizing, I guess is what I'd hope for, that this is something that's really a gift. It's not something to be afraid of, but our culture and the church and others have made it seem, you know, such a foreign thing that you should never, ever talk to the deceased. We'll be right back. Dr. Julie Beischel is our guest. Among Mediums, A Scientist's Quest for Answers is her ebook. You can go to her website, www.windbridge.org. Hello, this is Dr. Daniel Four, author of Ancestral Medicine, Rituals for Personal and Family Healing. You can learn more about me and my work at ancestralmedicine.org. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zahara Hieronymus. We're currently joined by Dr. Julie Beischel. Her ebook, I encourage you to read it, Among Mediums, A Scientist's Quest for Answers, and it's by the Windbridge Institute, a 2013 release. You can go to www.windbridge.org. And, you know, Julie, when you looked at all of this and as a scientist looking at it without any prejudice and without any expectation, is there anything that has surprised you as you've proceeded in this direction? I think that that um, that the dead are not all knowing. I think that was pretty surprising to me that I, that they still are just people. Um, and I think it's really interesting that it seems that the process, uh, that you continue learning and growing too, that it doesn't, you don't just stop, right. You, you continue to be a better person, um, and attempt, you know, to learn things. I, I was, I was excited to know that there was still learning. I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan of learning. <laughs> <laughs> um, even on the other side. Yeah. yeah, well, it's fascinating. I mean, when you start to do the clinical research that discusses what the ancient teachings have always maintained, you know, that Earth is a classroom, and then we leave the Earth, but we don't really leave it. We just sort of go out of our bodies, but we're still part of the Earth conversation and the work. And it's just a little more difficult, from what I understand, because you can't necessarily push matter around. So there are many teachings that tell you whatever you think to do while you're living, do it, because when you don't have a physical body, you have to work through other living beings and motivate them to carry out your vision or your will mm -hmm. or your or your you know, understanding. So there's a lot of collaboration that goes on. And I think Hollywood has done such a disservice to our sense of relationship in timelessness, because they've made it all seem so scary that everything's a haunting and it's all devilish. Yeah. And, it's, and the that truth is, the it's not. I was going to say that, yeah. like, that I was surprised to learn was the dead people are not scary. Like, right. Because, you're right, because everything that you've ever heard um, about the dead is that they're out to get you and they can hurt you. And no, they're just people. Yeah, there are bad people. There are mm -hmm. bad living people in the world, too. So it's, you know, but they're just people. Um, yeah. Well, and and as so I tell people I love that you... what you do and that I'm so fascinated when um, current modern research conclusions 
mimic what ancient uh, wisdom yeah. said. I love when those two things come together. Yeah, I do too. But I think that's kind of the time period we're in because quantum physics has helped do that and the kind of work you're doing and others that are focused on consciousness. And, you know, one of the, the very interesting things, though, is is that it is collaborative. And I think that's the beauty of what you're doing is that we don't lose anybody, just like nothing is ever fully gone. It's just turned into another form. So it's a mm-hmm. question of appreciating our various dimensions of being. And that's why I was so intrigued with what you're doing. And I think before the break, you would ask uh, about the normalization of this phenomena. And I think that that's really important because I've heard uh, so many horror stories about you know, young children diagnosed with schizophrenia, which is a disease that doesn't happen until your late twenties usually. And because they don't know what else to, it's, it's physicians and clinicians who aren't familiar with mediumship. And they, if someone says they're hearing voices, then they immediately assume that that's a pathological state, Mm -hmm. but we need to be educating people about this so that if that's troubling to those children that they can learn how to harness it and how to control it and how to provide boundaries so that they're not just being bombarded. And, you know, we need to learn more about this so that we can provide what people need when these things are happening to them and that we don't just drug them or institutionalize them. Like we need to be helping people. So I think that's really important. And um, one of the studies that we're, Um, currently doing is we're doing a hematology study so we're taking blood from mediums brave the brave mediums on our team uh, who let me stick them with the needle multiple times uh, before (laughs) and after a reading to so to see what happens Mm -hmm. physiologically to the body because a lot of mediums a lot of psychics have health problems and so that's something else we need to um, to learn more about so we can help the practitioners who you know if because if this is having uh, if this is sapping certain cofactors out of the body, then we need to be replacing them. And, you know, we don't know anything about that. Mm-hmm. So that's, again, a lot of the studies we do are the first step. And then a lot more needs to get done after that. But we need to address these very first steps before we can get any further. And like I said, this BAM study um, is the first step in addressing the potential therapeutic benefit of mediumship readings for the bereaved um, I'm really excited about that study. If people are interested in that, they can go to afterlifescience.com to learn more about the BAM study. Um, but I think that's that's my main focus now. I think that's going to be really important. Um, you know, we we're empiricists. We we collect data, and at the end of the day, it matters less to us how the things work than what they how they can help people and with my background in pharmacology there are so many drugs on the market that we don't really know how they work you can look it up you can look up mechanism of certain drugs they unknown unknown mechanism but Mm -hmm. they still sell them and people still use them and Mm -hmm. you know we don't know how a lot of things work in the world but they're we're familiar with them and we you know we they're part of our life and i'm looking forward to a time when that's how mediumship readings are viewed as yeah. like yeah maybe we can't ever explain it but mm-hmm. it's helping people and it's something that happens and it's a it's a talent it's a it's a perception people have and no more than that mm-hmm. and one of the things i've noticed and i think you commented it in your ebook is you know some of the mediums have migraines mm-hmm. many mediums i've noticed over the years are overweight If they do it professionally all of the time, and I remember one medium telling me that was just sort of this battery that they store, they bring in so much energy and they don't necessarily know how to let it go. Right. So if we could teach people and that they could do what they do while being able to keep their body healthy, that would be beneficial to everyone. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed was a really high prevalence of autoimmune disorders. And I, my theory, you know, I've no evidence to support this, but my theory is that because they are um, sort of taking in so many foreign people Mm -hmm. all day long, Mm -hmm. that maybe the body gets confused about what's self and what isn't. Um, And that that's why this predilection for autoimmune disorders. We don't know because Mm -hmm. we're at the very beginning of studying any of this stuff. That's very interesting. Yeah. And, I, you know, that's interesting relative to just intuitives in general or highly sensitive people, how, how oftentimes highly sensitive people might have these capacities of perception, um, but they're so overwhelmed by societal noise or light or the fluorescent lights in the grocery store. I mean, real things that affect so many people that nobody's really 
taking into account in terms of the lighting that's being used in schools, mm-hmm. which makes children hyperactive or bored yeah. or sleepy or anyway. So when you come then to look at what you're doing, what, what interests you that maybe you can't do right now, but you'd like to do? Oh, I would love to do uh, a neuroimaging study, but those are so expensive. Um, so a study like a, like a functional MRI study of mm-hmm. what's happening in real time in the medium's brain. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think that would get us, you know, very far in understanding a lot of um, how these things work. And or not, that, it may that. completely interfere with the capacity because of its own energetic form. That's true, because I have heard that too, um, and that would be an interesting finding as well. It, mm-hmm. Like like a lot of things, whatever we find will be something new and will be something interesting. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, that I'm I'm excited to do that. And so, and yes. what about I mean the TV program which I've watched a number of times and I've really liked it, Psychic Kids, where they help children just like you're saying who have these abilities they can't control them they're natural and then they need to be trained by a more developed practitioner. But what about children who have these skills, which presumably is more prevalent now than let's say 20 years ago? Um, well, I am not a clinician, mm-hmm. so I cannot. I don't have expertise in that. I can't speak to that. But I know that it is an important topic and that children are being misdiagnosed. Mm-hmm. And I that's agree with you. dangerous. I know that. Mm-hmm. That's as much as I can say. Though, I mm-hmm. And you're also, though, looking at Wimbridge Institute at investigating technologies that might be useful in enhancing, as you say, quote, interaction and communication like electronic voice phenomena and others. Yeah. You know, my my expertise, my specialty is is the study of medium is what my husband, Mark, my, my partner, we co-founded the Wimbridge Institute together. Um, that's his forte. He, um, he does the instrumental transcommunication, um, research and, and yeah, so you'll have to have him on and he can talk to you about Fascinating. that. Fascinating. And, and when you, I mean, you're now having an opportunity, the Institute, what is it? Is it 10 years old? Five. Five years old. So it's really yeah. young, but already you're really sort of starting something new, kicking up the dust, as they would say. And how have other professionals in general responded to this kind of work? Uh, well, I, you know, we got a lot of experts who agreed to be on our scientific advisory board right away. And that was really encouraging that people were were thinking, yeah, you know, we've met you. We know what you're capable of. We think you starting this institute is important and they, you know, will be part of it. And so that, that was really encouraging. And more often than not, I am meeting people who from all different kinds of fields who recognize that this is important and that, you know, science doesn't have boundaries and that if we don't know everything about something, we should continue to investigate it. Um, And, but I think that I'm running into those people because the people who, just dismiss all of this outright they don't show up to conferences that i'm at anyway Mm -hmm. so i don't encounter those people and Mm -hmm. uh i'm not interested in what they have to say no well (laughs) it's very fortunate now i mean when i think back 30 40 years ago when all of this work was sort of being discussed but wasn't really formalized and here we are now you know at the turn of the century into the first decade or so and to see that it's possible is just very heartening and again I don't even remember what website I was on that connected me to Windbridge but I first I love the name the Windbridge why did you choose that name oh um we wanted a name that uh had like a a very immaterial and Mm -hmm. a very material component Mm -hmm. and so you know, the sort of the yin and the yang mm-hmm. and the, you know, wind like spirit. You yeah. can't hold it or see it or measure it or you can measure it, but hold it. Um, but it's very powerful. Yeah, I thought it was spirit. lovely. And then, you know, bridge would be um, the bridge between this world and the next. Mm-hmm. So And the URL was available, right? That's how you always have to name things these days, <laughs> Yeah, right? that's it ultimately these days. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a beautiful title. Look, we have about a minute and a half left. Is there anything you'd like to share we've not touched on? Um, well, my husband and I are writing a book called Psychic Intimacy, and it's a handbook for couples about how you can use our non-local connections. So uh, I would invite people to join our email list to keep up to date on that and you know, as we publish things and talk at different conferences and that sort of thing, they can sign up on our email list on at winbridge.org. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. The, uh, because, you know, once you start practicing, of course, you can communicate across great distances with the living in your family. And of course, this is 
what people have talked about for centuries of knowing when somebody's in harm's way, even though they're right. thousands of miles away. But by the same token, if your children are traveling and you want to protect them, you can send them loving thoughts. Anything else along those lines? Um, I mean, the, 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 our purpose is for this handbook is to establish intimacy because we're so like, though we're so connected electronically, mm-hmm. I think we get separated um, and so to be even in the same room and, you know, think I'm thinking of this right. image and then having the other person be able to know it, too, like that establishes intimacy in a relationship. Mm-hmm. No, it's great. It's just wonderful. Well, I think the the work you all are doing, like Dr. Dean Radin said, I just think it's beautiful what you're doing. And it's such a great contribution to the world of science and the world of consciousness. I like what Dean said, who's been my guest. This research that takes place at the Winbridge Institute has been judged by international peers to be important and reflects the Institute's commitment to conducting world-class science. Congratulations, Dr. Beischel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Again, Among Mediums, A Scientist's Quest for Answers. It's an e-book. Go to www.winbridge.org. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Kortner. And I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. And remember, we do need more love in the world.